Uh, certainly a pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Hendricks, retired Navy captain, uh, my former boss here at uh, Naval History and Heritage Command, which was his last assignment prior to joining the Center for New American Security. And I uh, don't want to take any time from uh, Captain Hendricks, so I will say this. Uh, there are very few people today talking about history, naval history, and making it relevant to national security policy. Captain Hendricks is one of those individuals, so we're very honored to have him here today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. So if, if the slides come up, we can jump over there and we'll go, because it's really great Gucci pictures, and I enjoy uh, showing them because it, it shows Theodore Roosevelt and sort of all the different aspects. My book, of course, was Theodore Roosevelt's Naval Diplomacy, which was an outgrowth of my doctoral dissertation, which I did at King's College, uh, completing that in 2007, uh, while I was actually uh, as XO and CO of my squadron. So that, uh, for any of you who are thinking about going an academic line in the future and trying to figure out how you're gonna balance that, with, uh, with an operational career. It's not easy, but it can be done. Um, best place to write, uh, and I think you can go to Commander Armstrong on this, because Alfred Thayer Mahan was my chief teacher of this. Best place to write is at sea. Uh, there are no children to distract you. Uh, there are no uh, honeydew lists. Uh, once I got the flight schedule done, uh, on board USS Peleliu every night, which I had to push at, at uh, 1900. Um, from 1900 until 0100, every night I wrote and my goal was to write 800 words a day. I got interested in Theodore Roosevelt actually when I was a lieutenant. I was assigned to the USS Theodore Roosevelt CVN 71 uh, in 1995. I was coming out of the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. And there was one thing about being on board the TR, and that was that the guy lived there. There was so much Theodore Roosevelt memorabilia on board the ship, in the ship's library, uh, photographs of him, artifacts of him, had, we had our own museum, and we had family members. So you know you would come into port and the family would be on board to have some sort of a family event. So you met Theodore Roosevelt's grandchildren and great-grandchildren, which was really kind of strange because they're, they're all unique personalities, uh, mm -hmm. members of the Roosevelt family. Um, they all have hereditary aspects, like for instance, um, uh, uh, a photographic memory uh, falls in the male line. So almost all the men in the Roosevelt family can recover entire documents just by closing their eyes and their fingers go up and they start to read. You know, it kind of freaks me out. But <clears throat> I got interested in Theodore Roosevelt at that point in time, and one of the things that intrigued me was the controversy surrounding the Venezuela crisis of 1902, because it's controversial still to this day because Roosevelt gave a version of events which was that he issued an ultimatum to the Germans and to the British uh, and to the Italians to a lesser case. Um, and yet, those people who look at diplomatic history says, no, he didn't. There is no documentary evidence that Roosevelt ever issued an ultimatum. An ultimatum. There's nothing in the, foreign, uh, in the State Department records. We see nothing in the records of the German foreign ministry or the British foreign ministry. And that was intriguing to me. So this was the controversy. It raged for, for nearly, uh, you know, 100 years at that point in time, actually about 90 years at that point. Um, and so, but the, the controversy was really interesting because they were absolutely correct. There was nothing in the foreign policy records. In fact, that was an oddity because there's nothing. There's a 10-day gap in the foreign policy records, almost as if something had been removed from the records. Something, there's a blank spot, as it were. And so I was really intrigued by this because if Roosevelt did what he did, said he did, which was that he issued an ultimatum and then he dispatched the Atlantic fleet to essentially challenge the, uh, the uh, German and British blockade of Venezuela, then there had to be records someplace. And because I'm a naval officer, I know all about logbooks, as all of us know about logbooks. We don't do anything without writing it down on a piece of paper. You know, we don't upload the Mark 23 you know, sea whiz mount on, on, a, on a carrier without writing it down in the TAO's logbook or perhaps we do it in the OOD's logbook. So I went back to the operational record and I began to look at the operational record and it was extremely revealing because there's uh, documents in there that George Dewey, who was the Admiral of the Navy, you know, equivalent of a six star rank today, that he was in fact there in the Caribbean, that the entire Atlantic fleet had been uh, assembled, are we good? Okay, okay. That the entire Atlantic fleet had been assembled down there, um, and that Dewey summons all of his captains on board, sort of with that Horatio Nelson Nelson's touch dinner, 
And, and that evening, and that's all in the law books, and in that evening, uh, Dewey writes a letter to his son and said, you know, things are looking a little strange down Venezuela way, but we're not in it yet, perhaps tomorrow. And so it's very clear from the operational record that the United States is preparing for war. Dewey had done things like, for instance, recalling all the ambulatory sick from hospitals. He ordered all the doctors off from his ships and they built a 60-bed trauma hospital on Calibra Island in the Caribbean. He ordered, despite the fact that they're there nominally on the winter exercise, none of the ships were allowed to go in and go into cold iron for inspections of their steam plants. He kept them all at full steam at all times, ready to sortie at any moment. He ordered them all to be uploaded with ammunition. And so as an operator, this is, I recognize this is not an exercise. This is certainly not the winter exercise when the fleet is going to get ready to hit every port and booze it up all the way around the Caribbean. This is wartime footing and preparation. And so in looking over that record, I wrote my first you know, article on this. Because when you're, when you're in academia, one of the things you really want to do is if you find something new, you want to lock down ownership of that. And so I published an article uh, in Proceedings Magazine uh, way back, I think, in about 2001, where I looked at the operational record and I got that out there. And then I began to build it up layer by layer. So I went to Harvard as a federal executive fellow, and I sort of expanded the Venezuela story out into a master's thesis. And then I took that and I went to King's College and then continued to do my operational research. But I took a different approach. Most of the time, if you look at the history of the 20th century, people took sort of the macro level of, uh, look, you know, sort of like we're going to hang a microphone over the globe and I'm going to look at the conversations between great leaders and great powers. And it's really that State Department foreign policy look at history. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we're missing here. So I started to look again. Here we go, at the operational record. We're going to flash through a number of different slides pretty quickly because I'm, I'm like five slides into this now uh, once we get hooked up. But I wanted to make sure that we took an approach that combined the military, the navalist approach, which was sort of writing from the deck plates, with that approach of looking at foreign policy and try and combine those things uh, into one form. Okay, all right. So, so that was uh, how I sort of launched into this, um, was, uh, was trying to combine these, these two disciplines of, uh, of naval history. By the way, this is a really cool photograph. Um, it's always interesting when you get involved in, in, uh, in doing, uh, doing history um, is that you get to go, um, you know, uh, slumming around in, in other people's collections. This particular photograph, which I had never seen before, and in fact, not even the Naval Institute had ever seen it before, uh, resided in a guy, uh, private collection out in Washington State. And I found him online. He's an aficionado of the Great White Fleet. And this is actually President Theodore Roosevelt reviewing the Great White Fleet as it's leaving to go on the cruise uh, in 1908. So they, they leave at the, at the end of his administration. We'll kind of catch up on this. But I found this photograph is like, okay, that photograph is really what it's all about, which is, you know, Theodore Roosevelt's diplomacy, which was very much a naval diplomacy. So again, I'm going to, uh, forgive me for moving along. This was sort of the, the outline of what I was going to cover, the four case studies, Venezuela, Panama, 1903, Morocco, and then the Portsmouth, naval tr uh, or the Portsmouth Peace Treaty between uh, Russia and Japan, where it became that. So again, two different schools of approaching Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt is a navalist. A lot of people wrote about Theodore Roosevelt in the Navy. Reckner's book on Roosevelt's Great White Fleet and Kimmel's, or Wimmel's book, again, on a similar topic. A lot of people had covered that. Other people had done a look at Roosevelt. Um, oh, there. Pushed the wrong button. Had looked at Roosevelt as a diplomat. Others had looked at him as a navalist. Very few had gone to kind of pull them together to look at Roosevelt in what was a remarkably comprehensive foreign policy. Very cogent, very coherent foreign policy. Uh, if you really look at the foreign policies of the various administrations in the 20th century, Roosevelt is a breakout foreign policy in, in how remarkably strong it was and how far it extended in the 20th century today. 
You might even say that today we see in U.S. foreign policy circles a debate between Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, between what, they, what one guy called the warrior and the priest, because Wilson believed in sort of a very idealistic foreign policy. Roosevelt is the ultimate realist. Roosevelt would cut a deal with the devil, you know, if it was going to promote U.S. national interest. Wilson believed in you know, pursuing a very idealistic approach to U.S. foreign policy. A lot of people see President Obama today very much in line with the Wilsonian school of foreign policy. So um, again, this was the claim that Roosevelt communicated in 1902, demanding that the Germany submit to arbitration. Um, the diplomatic record doesn't show. Historians believe that Roosevelt was lying to embellish his reputation. He made these assertions in 1914. Uh, in a letter in 1914. And so here we are, war is raging in Europe, the Kaiser isn't popular anymore, and it looks like Roosevelt is horning in and saying, I hated that guy back when I was president, but none of you knew about it. And, and so they all thought that he was just ginning up this story to make himself look good, because he was still very much a political figure at that time. However, again, these were the historical you know, paradigms. You know, looking at the world in a macro, Again, I wanted to invert the paradigm and look very much at the operational level at the individual ship logs. One of the things to keep in mind, and I know that I've got a leading Mahan and Sim scholar here, so I'll, I'll be very blunt on this. Roosevelt was a strategist before Mahan was, was known as a strategist. He had written his Naval War of 1812, which is really a, a great strategic document. All the aspects of Mahan's influence of sea power upon history, the different tenets of sea power are present in Roosevelt's book, but they are not distilled in the manner in which Mahan brought them forth so brilliantly 10 years later. Uh, he was a technical expert on naval technology. He immersed himself in this as a very young man. He had studied sail and gunnery from age 22 to 26. He built models. He played out entire battles in his home. Um, you know, he ruined things, according to his young wife. He promoted a new interpretation, a very muscular interpretation of the, Mahan doc uh, the Monroe Doctrine. And then he was also the major proponent in the United States of the concept of preparedness, that the, the Washington's forgotten maxim, that the surest guarantee of peace is to prepare yourself for war. And so he was very bellicose in his statements, but it's interesting, despite his bellicosity, that he never took the nation to war. Um, case studies, again, Venezuela, Panama's independence, the Perticaris effect, uh, affair, which one really bad movie was made of, and the Russo-Japanese War Peace Treaty, and of course the Great White Fleet was the, the culmination. This is the world as it exists in 1900. It's a world of colonial empires um, uh, that spread out. Um, at that time, when Roosevelt becomes president of the United States, this was the world that he lived in. Here's the naval order, which is the major chess pieces on the board. 1901, of course, Great Britain is sitting over here. The United States is over here. So, you know, these are battleships, and then you have armored cruisers, and then you have coastal defense vessels as it lays out. So that's your line of battle as TR comes into the presidency at the death of uh, William McKinley. But Roosevelt gets seven and a half years and in his seven and a half years, the United States goes from here to here. So we're the third ranked naval power in the world by 1909 as he leaves office. Great Britain is still in very much in the lead, but Great Britain is no longer able to maintain the two to one standard. Up until that time, Great Britain's standard for the size of its navy is it had to be larger than the next two navies combined. But Roosevelt's build program essentially puts the lie to that paradigm because the United States is now overtaking it. Great Britain actually kind of makes the deal with us and turns the Caribbean over to us and says, you take care of our interests there. So case one, <clears throat> Venezuela crisis. Uh, Roosevelt, very young in his administration. He's been in office for less than a year when this occurs, and he really uses naval power as a blunt instrument. It looks very much that Roosevelt is personally involved. What, what's amazing in looking at the message traffic is that you will look at uh, telegraphs and there's Roosevelt's personal handwriting on the telegraphs all over this. Roosevelt is communicating directly with individual ship commanders as well as with Dewey as the fleet commander. The fact that Dewey is there, the Admiral of the Navy, Roosevelt goes to him, personally asks him to get out of a sickbed and take the fleet to sea because Dewey's prestige was such, of such magnitude that he knew that that would send a message. And then Roosevelt gives Dewey the Mayflower, the presidential yacht as his flagship, a great indicator of Roosevelt's support. So going down there, um, you know, non-operational um, 
you know, there's not a whole lot of finesse in this. We're going to go down, we're, we're flooding the Caribbean with the entire Atlantic fleet. It's very clear that we're overwhelming the British and the German fleet that's there. They are well outside their supply lines. They cannot resupply. They cannot send additional people there in time if Roosevelt chooses to take decisive action. Again, we talked about the 60-bed trauma hospital, and then we talked about establishing the Monroe Doctrine. After Roosevelt essentially carries the day with the Venezuela crisis, and the British do accept arbitration, the Germans do as well, uh, and they, they pull their fleet back and they go to the International Court, Tribunal Court at The Hague to settle the Venezuela uh, is in arrears, and essentially Venezuela agrees to pay on a different payment plan, and, and the European powers agree that they're not going to blockade any uh, Western Hemispheric countries without going through the United States. Our essential sovereignty over the Western Hemisphere is now recognized at least uh, in uh, informal ways after this particular crisis going forward. So that was the first uh, crisis, and again, it's the operational naval record that brings this out. Case study two is Panama, and this was really interesting to me because um, it was very clear uh, we had tried to negotiate with Colombia to gain access to a canal zone. And the Colombian, we had passed it in our Senate, a treaty with Colombia to gain access to the, the zone. And then it went back to Colombia for their Senate to pass. And the Colombian Senate kind of looked at it and they came back to us and they said, you know, this looks good, but I think maybe you need to kick in a little bit more. And they kind of walked around with American agents in Colombia with their pockets out open and their hands out. They wanted to be bought. And Roosevelt just said, I'm not going to do that. I made a good financial deal with Colombia that we were going to pay them an upfront cost and we would pay them a rent into the future. I'm not going to bribe independent or individual Colombian senators to get this treaty. Up until this time, we had already put down some 50 revolutions in Panama that Panama had wanted to declare its independence. The United States had essentially been a guarantee of Colombian sovereignty along the railroad line that split the isthmus at this time. So essentially Roosevelt makes the decision not that he's going to encourage Panamanian independence, but simply that he will not put down the next independence movement. And that once independence is declared, that he would support it. The Colombian, or the Panamanians understanding this essentially look for the next time a U.S. Navy ship arrives, and when they see it, they declare their independence. And so it is that when the USS Nashville, uh, an unarmored pocket cruiser, shows up, they declare their independence. And it gets touch and go there for a while, because at one point in time, uh, the Colombians show up with a, with a, with a, uh, a, a troop ship, and they re-seize the port. And then suddenly, oddly, almost miraculously, an American troop ship shows up carrying a load of Marines and disgorges the Marines on the beach. The Marines are actually headed by a young captain by Le, named Lejeune, and he actually stands them down, but very, very close to going to war with Colombia at this point in time. What is interesting about this is that Roosevelt actually sends the Marines to Panama with a war plan, and the Commandant of the Marine Corps gets on board a ship and goes to Panama with the Marines in an expeditionary brigade. Now the war plan was, oddly enough, not to defend Colombia, but actually was to reboard on ships, I'm sorry, not to defend Panama, but to actually get on board Navy ships, go to Cartagena, Colombia, march on their capital, and dictate terms of peace in the Colombian capital. So it was a secret war plan, not known. It was the last time the Commandant of the Marine Corps commanded troops in the field in a wartime setting was during this crisis. But what was interesting about this to me was at any point in time, all that appeared was one ship. There was one ship on one coast, there was another ship on the other coast. But in looking at the operational record, Roosevelt had ships stacked up over the horizon. So the appearance of that Marine troop ship at that opportune moment after the Colombians had showed up was not an accident. But Roosevelt was only going to apply the right amount of pressure necessary to get it done. As opposed to the blunt instrument in Venezuela, this is a very nuanced, discreet application of naval force. But he had more to come in case there was increased resistance. He had cruisers, he had battleships, he had troop ships stacked up, up and down the Panamanian coast, ready to roll in if the situation required it. 
So the Perticaris affair, this was kind of interesting because this is occurring during the presidential election season. So an American citizen, or at least someone who we thought was an American citizen by the name of Jan uh, uh, Perticaris is kidnapped by a Moroccan uh, brigantine. And so it makes the press and people come to Theodore Roosevelt uh, saying that we need to, uh, to get this guy back. So Roosevelt just sort of offhand dispatches an American squadron to go uh, to Morocco uh, to, to try and coerce the Moroccans into giving him back at, the, at Tangier. The problem is, is they're not really in control of their country. Things are falling apart. It's, it's a very loose, the, 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 the Sultan does not really exert local control over this, this brigand. And, and then they come back to Roosevelt to say, hey look, you know, the, the ship showed up they sort of dropped anchor outside the port and nothing really changed. And so at this point in time, Roosevelt sends another squadron down. Again, he's distracted by the presidential campaign and the convention because Roosevelt's very focused on winning the presidency in his own right. Uh, he had been vice president last time, now he's gonna win the presidency on his own. Um, he actually goes in front of the convention at Chicago and says, we want uh, Perticaris alive or Razuli, the name of the, of the brigand, the kidnapper, or Razuli dead. And that became a rallying cry, made all the newspapers, it was great politics. But then Roosevelt begins to realize after there's no response to the second squadron, and he's got a third one coming on the way, that he's kind of run up against the wall. He realized that there's actually a limit to naval power. That if you cannot actually land the troops and go inland, uh, you can't put foot, uh, feet, uh, boots on the ground, then you're gonna run out of influence unless you're really in that coastal region. He actually does get ready to land troops. They actually sort of assemble themselves into different um, a mixture between the Marine Corps and the Navy to get ready to go aside, uh, ashore. But um, and in the end, there's no shelling, there's no troop landing, and there's no seizure of the Moroccan Customs House. What in fact we do is a diplomatic uh, negotiation through the British that results in the return of Perticaris to us uh, through the payment of essentially a ransom uh, that we did through the British because Roosevelt realizes that he can't make the commitment he wants here but he needs to kind of make this one go away because it's the election season. But the lesson learned here is that there is actually a limit to naval power. Um, it's kind of interesting because once we got Perticaris back we found out that during the Civil War because he was a southerner he had renounced his American citizenship so he wouldn't be called up to fight for the Confederacy. And so he was actually technically a Greek citizen at that time, but he's American by birth. And so we had committed the United States to this huge international debacle. And in fact, the guy really was a coward and we shouldn't have had anything to do with him whatsoever. Um, case story study four, this was really kind of interesting because there was no movement of major naval vessels or troops, but it was the question of why, why did we negotiate a peace treaty at a Navy Yard? Given all the places in the United States for us to host a peace conference, and this was the first major peace conference negotiated or, or to, be, to, to occur on the North American continent. <clears throat> so why did Roosevelt go to Portsmouth, New Hampshire of all places? Well, what's interesting about it is that Roosevelt had an appreciation for European court um, activities. We were a republic, so we had no pomp and pageantry. You know, in, court, in, in European courts, diplomats actually had uniforms and they would have brocade and they would have swords, diplomats walking around in uniforms and swords in, in, in the courts of France and in Germany. But in the United States, we're a republic, so we can't do that. And yet we're bringing in uh, Russians and Japanese, two very old fashioned traditional courts and so Roosevelt substitutes military pomp and pageantry to provide the backdrop for the negotiations. So he sets it at the Navy Yard in Portsmouth with his cool, because this is occurring in August and nobody wants to be in Washington, D.C. in August. So he puts it up, not even Roosevelt, he's in Oyster Bay, New Hampshire, or uh, Oyster Bay, New York. And he puts this up there. He meets with them on board the Mayflower at sea. He has them taken up there by boat. We do the full gun salutes and we meet them. 
And then we put them in a building up there. And if you go to Portsmouth, the building still occurs and the table is still there where they negotiated the peace treaty. But what's interesting is Roosevelt very, even though he's not there, he's very much in control of the negotiations. He's monitoring the negotiations. Now, how's he doing that? He limits them to one telegraph line. All telegraphs in and out of the negotiations go through building 57. There's one line that's run by a Navy operator. And so, now I'm not saying that Roosevelt read the other guy's telegraphs. I don't think that he did, honestly. But he knew when they were communicating, who they were communicating to, and how big those telegrams were. And so he had a sense of the tempo and, and when it was going bad and when it was going good. And when it got going the worst and the negotiations were about to break down, Roosevelt summoned both parties to Oyster Bay. They were brought down on trains. He met with them separately, individually. And then he contacted their, 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 their capitals. He, he contacted the czar and he contacted the emperor. And he was able to get them back in and get the negotiations to come to a culmination. But Roosevelt made full use of, essentially, by, by owning the home court, he kept full use and he, he used the military essentially as an instrument of diplomacy. And so because of that, because of the role he played, he became the first North American to earn a Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize. Kind of unique right now, we're in that Nobel Prize season. I saw that uh, the physics one went out yesterday and there was another one announced, I think, for chemistry today. But Roosevelt earns the Nobel Prize, and which is unique. You know, his Nobel Prize, eventually the family donated to the White House and his Nobel Prize sits in the Roosevelt Room uh, there in the White House, which is just off from the Oval Office. And then I, I was very fortunate as a, as a junior historian, and because I knew the family, I was actually brought in to help the family um, reapply because Roosevelt had been nominated for the Medal of Honor for his actions at San Juan Hill and Kettle Hill during the Spanish-American War. Uh, so we re-put together the package. It had actually been shot down because the Secretary of the Army recognized him as a political rival. They didn't want him to get the medal. And so Roosevelt was not granted the medal for his actions, but we were able to reapply through the, the system and he was awarded the Medal of Honor uh, for his actions in Spanish-American War in 2003. Uh, I know that because it was actually occurred, my wife was pregnant with our second child, and we actually went to the White House and participated in that. So now the Medal of Honor and the Nobel Peace Prize sit side by side in the Roosevelt Room at the White House. You would have to go back uh, 2,200 years to find another leading individual to have won the highest award for peace and the highest award of valor uh, in one lifetime. So TR is a pretty unique individual from that standpoint. Really an exceptional individual. You know, he could read seven languages, speak five, had total photographic memory. Um, it, uh, it, it's quite interesting in engaging him at an intellectual level on all that he was able to do. He's one of the leading naturalists in North America. He knew more about North American mammals than any other individual alive. The Smithsonian consulted with him on a monthly basis on their exhibits. In fact, he shot most of the stuff that was in their exhibits. <laughs> Roosevelt's very much in charge, so these are sort of the, my findings, and I'm wrapping this up now. His brother-in-law, the, the, the Navy captain who married his sister, his beloved sister, Bammy, uh, was a Navy captain by the name of Cowles. And I have read uh, Captain, later Admiral Cowles' uh, correspondence. He is not a real intellectual heavyweight um, at all. Um, very basic. He knew his craft. Uh, he'd gotten into an accident with his battleship, he was court-martialed, he survived, uh, went on to make flag rank and so on. But he's, he's not intellectually dynamic, but when Roosevelt becomes president, Cowles is brought to the White House and named Roosevelt's naval aide. It was one way of kind of keeping his favorite sister around to help watch the kids, because Roosevelt had like five kids and they were crazy. Um, so, uh, so Cowles is in the White House and Cowles begins to issue telegrams to fleet commanders and to individual ship captains. And Cowles is freaking brilliant. I mean, it's amazing what he's doing in these things. And for those four years that he's the naval aide of the president, he is the most brilliant naval officer I've read. And then he goes back and he leaves the White House and he goes back to this, you know, taciturn, you know, uninspired. And so it's very clear what I'm trying to say is that Theodore Roosevelt is writing all of his brother-in-law's correspondence at this time. It's like, hey, take this down and send it because he realizes it's kind of inappropriate. Cowell's correspondence is really energy. So Roosevelt's very much involved in managing foreign policy. 
These are his two secretaries of state, John Hay and Elihu Root. Now that's normal. Most eight-year presidencies generally have two secretaries of state. Pretty cool, that's, that's fine, that all makes sense. Now, Secretary of the Navy at that time is the cabinet, it's a cabinet level. It's not like it is today with SecDef and then the, the service secretaries. SecNav and Secretary of War come and sit at the cabinet at this point in time. So this is normal Secretary of State. So Roosevelt has Secretary of the Navy. So let's see, what did he do with Secretary of the Navy? <laughs> Seven years, five guys. So when you're changing Secretaries of the Navy every 14 months, who's in charge of the Navy? The president. the president is. And in fact, when this guy, who had been his father's best friend, and Abraham Lincoln's personal secretary, this is John Hay, this is a venerable individual. I mean, he is respected, he's an author, he's a poet, he's a godlike creature in American life at this point in time. When John Hay moves a squadron of Navy ships at one point in time, Roosevelt summons him and says, you will not move the Navy without my express permission. It is under my purview as commander in chief. And Hay never touches the Navy again. These guys, some of these guys, he goes home, he goes to the Supreme Court, he goes back to the Senate, he becomes Secretary of the Treasury, he becomes Attorney General, he goes home, okay? Roosevelt uses the Navy place as a holding place to figure out if the guy's gonna work someplace else in the government. But the Navy works for TR and TR alone. So, what are the lessons that come out of Roosevelt? Consistent foreign policy based upon American interests. Now again, I will tell you, Roosevelt would make a deal with the devil if he thought it was in America's national interest. There's not really that much idealism in Roosevelt's foreign policy. He's interested in our business concerns. He's interested in our power structure. He's interested in our role in the world. He is not interested in spreading freedom and democracy throughout the world, okay? Um, very much old school. Bismarck and TR probably would have got along really well if they'd gotten together. Rise of coercive diplomacy. Again, what's interesting is despite the fact that Roosevelt's one of the most bellicose speaking and writing figures in American history, he never takes us to war. I've showed you four instances when he could have just jumped ugly, gone to the Congress and said, let's declare lower, let's go. You know, kind of like Bryce Hopper and Jonathan Papelbaum. You know, let's do it, you know. Um, but he doesn't. He uses coercive diplomacy. He applies just the right amount of pressure to bring about a peaceful result upholding American interests. It's really, uh, when I started to read Alexander George, who's one of the great scholars of, of coercion, I saw so much of Roosevelt in it. George had written about Vietnam, and so that's why I chose the title of my doctoral dissertation, uh, the, you know, of, of, of coercive diplomacy, because Roosevelt is really using the Navy as, an, as a rheostat adjustment to bring about American, uphold American national interests. This is the, the rheostat, scalability of response. The Navy gives you an amazing ability to flow in and flow out forces. I can keep you know, one ship there, but I can have 20 ships over the horizon. So how much do I need today? Is it a one ship, two ship, or three ship problem? Roosevelt understood this, and he would arrange the fleet accordingly to be able to flow them in and flow them out as he needed them. Never too much, because when you send too much, well, that's the wrong message. Suddenly people get affronted, you know, and, and, uh, and they're offended by the, by the fact that you showed up with too much. That's what happened kind of with the Atlantic fleet in Venezuela. What he does in Panama shows a real amount of nuance after that. The seamless spectrum of military power, again, Roosevelt understood, well, I'll be done before then. Uh, Roosevelt understood that, you know, someday it's gonna be a platoon size element of Marines, and then it's gonna be a squadron. And, but that spectrum between building partnership capacity and security force assistance all the way to full-on war is a seamless spectrum, and it's a spectrum that has to be populated. You need to have a capability in your Navy to do the low end just as well as you need a capability to do the high end, and you need to have a balance in the force across there. Roosevelt <clears throat> knew that was he was leaving office, he had, he had by that point in time put 36 battleships under contract. We either had them or they were in the process of being built when he left. He was running out of states to name them after. I mean, that was kind of the, you know, the, when he knew that he had done a pretty good job. But he knows in 1909, as the Great White Fleet comes home, that he does not have a balanced fleet. He is low on cruisers 
and he doesn't have enough destroyers, which was this new innovation that had come along while he was there. The first destroyers are beginning to come into the fleet at this time. He's also really heavily invested in new things like airplanes and in submarines. He actually went down in one of our first submarines and went underneath Oyster Bay. They brought it up. Uh, it was called USS Plunger, which I always thought was an awkward name for a, for a submarine. <laughs> But Roosevelt went down in the plunger and was underneath Oyster Bay for an hour, actually manipulating the controls uh, on this submarine down there. So he's, he actually gives submariners subpay by executive order after coming up from the plunger. He says, you know, that's a nasty environment down there. I think you guys ought to get a little extra money. And so Roosevelt initiates submarine pay uh, after that. And then he comes to understand the limits of power, in this case, naval power understanding that there's only so much that you can do with military force or certain aspects of, naval, of military force. It's sh good to show up with the fleet, but you know what? If you can't land the troops, then you're gonna, someone may call your bluff at that point in time, and then what are you going to do? You know, guns at that point in time could only go 16 miles inland. You know, now battleships can go 23, but at that time he was dealing with 12-inch bores, and so he was limited by that was his level of, of exposure. So he needed to kind of... Uh, understand that you have to fall in with other aspects of the military. The, ro the army starts to get built up towards the end of Roosevelt's administration. So that is the point. The thing that I would say here about the voice of Roosevelt is that, you know, this guy has been dead. Uh, he died in uh, 1919, <clears throat> and so he's been gone almost 100 years. But if we listen really closely, we hear the voice of Roosevelt today. We see it in the debate in foreign policy circles. We see it in the debate. You know, my good friend Brian McGrath uh, just released a paper uh, earlier this week, and I think they're rolling it out formally tomorrow, about the importance of aircraft carriers. And Brian and I have debated that back and forth. The, the debate about the size and structure of your Navy, the debate about the size and structure and use and application of your military is a debate that Theodore Roosevelt began when he took the, the U.S. Uh, government, which was very focused on the internal continental challenges of settling this continent, and pivoted them to where the country began to look outward and become a world power. Roosevelt's voice is still being uh, listened to today, whether we actually recognize it as his voice or not. And so if you want to understand where we're at and where we're going, you can trace yourself back to the first great captain of the American, uh, the American modern uh, state, which is Theodore Roosevelt. Thank you very much. Yeah, so the, the thing about there was that Roosevelt ran up against a hard limit in what naval power could do because he wasn't able, there, there, there was, he was up against a really soft, spongy um, uh, opponent in that the, the person he thought he was coercing, which was the sultan, really didn't have any power over his internal state. In fact, that, that sultanate would fold you know, within the next five years and it would be replaced by, I think it was a, a German colony essentially in Morocco. Uh, I think, I, no, I'm wrong, I think it was the French. But, once he, be, once he became aware that he was kept sending this amount of power, and it should be enough to overawe anybody, uh, but it wasn't. And when he began to ask local actors, why isn't it having the effect, they came back and says, the guy's terrified. He just can't do anything. <laughs> um, and so coming up with that sort of a limitation that the next step that you had to take was to dismount your troops and go inland and find Perticaris or go after Razuli. And we simply were not manned and equipped in those squadrons to be able to bring that type of an expeditionary force into being and be able to go off and do that. Uh, as it was, uh, the British and the French and the Germans all stepped in and helped us negotiate a settlement, which was that uh, the Sultan actually was to give some gold to Rizzoli to return the nominal American citizen who ended up not to be an American citizen. Yep. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You mentioned you, uh, you know the Roosevelt family. Uh, I read a book about the Bellis brothers mm -hmm. and learned interestingly that one of uh, TR's grandsons and great grandsons worked for the CIA in the 50s and 60s. Is that the Roosevelt that you know? Actually, the, so Kermit is the grandson who actually uh, oversaw the installation of the Shah of Iran um, in the 1950s. Uh, Kermit's grandson is Tweed Roosevelt, and Tweed is actually a very good friend of mine. Um, really kind of an interesting family. 
um, and, uh, and very proud of his, of his father. I have his father's autobiography, which is really, you want to talk about in, you know, hair-raising intelligence schemes, um, but uh, the, the Roosevelt family was deeply involved. If you think about TR, TR won the Medal of Honor. TR had four sons. Amongst the four sons, there's a Medal of Honor, there's three Distinguished Service Crosses, there are 14 Purple Hearts. There's one Distinguished Flying Cross in there. Two of them were medically retired out of the military as 100% disabled. Both of them managed to talk their way back into the Army in World War II. Of course, TR the Jr., Ted Jr., was the Deputy uh, Division Commander at Normandy, won the Medal of Honor at, uh, for leading his troops at Normandy, and then died of a heart attack uh, 24 days later. Uh, so Ted uh, uh, Roosevelt Jr. is a great hero. What's also interesting about that collection of medals is uh, the youngest son, Quentin, was a pilot. He was shot down in World War I and killed. So Quentin won the DFC, the Distinguished Flying Cross, and the Purple Heart. All the other medals are hold, held by the three older brothers. Just really one of the most distinguished family uh, histories of, of service. But as they all said, you know, with, with TR as a father, what else could we do? I mean, what a, what a, a challenge he, he set for them. And I would tell you, Roosevelt knew and bore the responsibility for the example he set for his sons. When Quentin was killed in World War I, who was their baby, um, he was totally heartbroken. In fact, most people think that he died in 1919 because he bore the responsibility for the death of his youngest son because of the, the standard of service that he had set. And uh, it broke his wife's heart, it broke his heart, and it was something that he, he took to his grave. Yes? Um, could you expound upon uh, the, the origins of his interest in naval affairs and the Naval War of 1812? So how did he get into all that? Well, his, he had two uncles uh, who were Confederates. Uh, one of them had actually served on board CSS Alabama uh, and actually claimed uh, the person who fired the last shot at the Kearsarge uh, in that duel between Alabama and Kearsarge. His other brother was, a, or his other uncle was a spy for the Confederate Navy and actually uh, stayed most of the war in London feeding information back to the Confederacy about Union ship movements. Roosevelt grew up reading uh, fictional stories about navies and, and, uh, and, and sea power, sort of like Horatio Hornblower, uh, for any of you who actually read that, or, or Jack Aubrey novels. Roosevelt wrote the, read the equivalents of those, and then he also would sit at his uncle's feet when the family would go to London, because they, they both exiled themselves to London and lived out their lives there after the war. And he would listen to their stories about fighting at sea. And so he said that he, he listened to stories of ships and ships and the sinking of ships until it sunk into the depths of my soul. And so Roosevelt grew up loving the Navy. And that's why at Harvard he chose to write his senior thesis on the Naval War of 1812. And what's amazing is Roosevelt publishes that at age 23. And to this day, over 100 years later, it's still the preeminent book on that topic. He did such a good job at 23 that it still sets the standard for scholarship on, on that particular topic. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks again for coming out. Uh, thank we'll you. Have, thank you, Jerry. Yeah. Oh, thanks. As always, I thank the class of 1950 for their support of the Scheidt Lectures. The next one we'll have is the first poet uh, oh, we've yeah. ever had for the Scheidt Lectures, uh, Victoria Kelly, who wrote When Men Go Off to War. So spread the word, especially let, the English majors. Let me tell you a side story. When I was at Harvard University doing my master's in federal executive fellowship at the Weatherhead Center, Victoria Kelly Sprout at that time was my research associate. And Tori actually read all of this book and actually was the person who helped edit it for me and put it, you know, it, she's a brilliant writer. She won virtually every writing award in the state of New Jersey where she grew up while she was still in high school. Uh, she's written novels, she's written poems, um, and, and unfortunately I'm responsible for her marrying a naval aviator because I got her a fellowship that summer to come down here to the Council of Formulations and then she met Will uh, who was over here at the Academy and then um, she went uh, to some poet thing in, in, in Ireland. Will went as a Rhodes Scholar to Oxford, and, and I, I swear that, this is, uh, that their children will be like supermen because they're two of the most brilliant people you ever want to meet. Will was a brigade commander, I think, here, um, and then Kelly is just a tremendous person. So you're really going to enjoy the, her book her, uh, and, and her novel. She has a novel coming out early next spring. She's a tremendous individual. Yeah, on Mrs. Houdini. Yeah. So, fantastic. Please do come and see Kelly. Uh, and as a final note, uh, Victoria. Kevin, Kevin Hendricks mentioned Brian McGrath earlier. If you have a chance, go to YouTube or C-SPAN 
and watch the debate on the future of aircraft carriers that the museum sponsored earlier this year in January between Jerry Hendricks and Brian McGrath. In a season of debates which aren't arguably debates, but this was a debate, a civil debate, an informed debate about a very important topic, so I would encourage you to watch it and you'll yeah. understand why, why Jerry is, is one of the great new minds of this era. Okay. Thank you very much, have a great week.